Paul is setting forth certain religious errors that we need to be on guard against and to avoid. One of them we dealt with in the last message was religious intellectualism, where it just seems the tendency of human nature to minister to that intellectual pride that's in all of us in the sense that we have to deal with it and not submit to it because everyone likes to be thought of as well-educated or he or she knows what they're doing. They're an authority in some subject, even if it's how to make meatballs. <laughs> so everyone likes to have his pride ministered to, and so that's just one of the things that God resists and we have to put off. Now he's dealing with other errors besides exchanging a cap and gown for Christ and the gospel, as so many seem pleased to do, and that is legalism, mysticism, and asceticism. We want to deal, first of all, with legalism, verses 8 to 17. Paul says, Beware lest any spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit. Now, to spoil means deceive. After the tradition of men. How about that? There it is. And Christendom is filled with the traditions and creeds of men. But beware of religious philosophies that will deceive you after the traditions of men, after the rudiments of the world, that is, the ways of the world, and not after Christ. As we said last time, people get involved in trying to make a school out of the church. While the church is a school, they want to make a school out of the church and hospitals and old people's homes and get involved in all sorts of institutionalism after the ways of the world. And they become acceptable to the world because the church is so often patterned in so many ways like the world, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead in bodily form. And ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power, in whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, and putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, wherein also you are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead, and you being dead in your sins and uncircumcision of your flesh, has he made alive with him, having forgiven you all trespasses." blotting out the handwriting of ordinances, or the law that was against us, contrary to us, and he took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. Now, I don't think anything could be plainer than that, and I've never understood Adventism in light of Colossians 2, and their works salvation and trying to bring us back under law. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them, and he didn't go down into hell three days as an unregenerate sinner to do it, as we're taught. But we're told here his cross triumphed over the principalities and powers, and he made a show of them openly and triumphed over them in it. Let no man therefore judge you in meat or drink or in respect of a holy day or of a new moon or a Sabbath day, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ." The second form of error we're to avoid after religious intellectualism we dealt with last week is legalism. You see, there are always those who try to superimpose their religious philosophy upon Christianity. That's why you have all these denominations, superimpositions of man's ideas about the Word of God or not really about the Word of God always, but his own religious ideas that he wants to promote. And of course these are philosophies. Now philosophy is not some word that can't be understood or we should avoid using. There is a Christian philosophy used in the right sense and it's what the Bible has to say and what it teaches. That's a philosophy if you use it in the sense of just using the term. But men have always tried to superimpose their philosophies upon the Christian faith seem to have a positive genius of twisting the Word of God to fit their own ideas and creeds. That's why he says, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy. That is, the vain reasonings of the mind, vain deceit, 
after the traditions of men, after the rudiments, the ways of the world, and not after Christ. And so instead of staying with the clear word of God, you'll find that people, that is some people, there are always some, invariably will not stay with the clear word of God, but they'll try to superimpose their ideas upon it. And many times you're charged with not having enough light if you don't follow their philosophy. Are you are not as deep as they are in the word or revelation? Or you don't have the light they have on faith or whatever? We run into this repeatedly, even here at Faith Assembly. It seems like some people insist on being philosophers first and Christians second. That is to say, they get their idea of what faith means or their idea about what the Christian life means. They get their ideas about whatever. And they want to superimpose that on the Word of God, whether you're talking about divorce or remarriage. Whatever. Now, they're not always Christians, but they embrace the Christian faith to the extent that their religious philosophy will permit them. And the Word of God is not their source of truth, their guide. They've made a God out of their religious philosophy. If you don't believe that, you try to correct some of their ideas with the Word of God, and you'll find out quickly enough just who their God is. It's their doctrine. It's their creed. It's their idea. And you can't change them. They're just some people you can't change. We've had them here. We get them here. They bring their ideas into the body. I want to superimpose it on faith assembly. I always thought it'd be for them easier to start their own group. I don't recommend that anybody start a group and start teaching error. That isn't what I'm saying. Don't bring your philosophies into faith assembly. We don't need them. We don't want them. They're after the tradition of men. They're after the rudiments of this world. The church is called to preach the gospel. That's all it's called to do. It's not called to get involved in social, humanitarian, educational Amen. projects, institutions, organizations of any kind. We've said this time and time again in the church, but it needs to be repeated. But there are those who insist on superimposing their philosophies upon the Christian faith. A good example as a group, not an individual, would be the Adventists, who superimposed their Sabbath and legalistic philosophy upon the Christian faith. You see, they didn't start a religion and say, we're Seventh-day Adventists, or we're Millerites, Miller, the false prophet. The whole Adventist movement, I guess as you know, started with a false prophecy. Christ was going to return at a certain date. When he didn't, even Miller admitted he made a mistake and was wrong, but the Adventists didn't give up. The group, instead of disbanding, they said, well, he just misinterpreted where Christ went. He didn't come back to earth. He went into the Holy of Holies with the blood because the atonement isn't finished and all that, which sounds a little familiar. The atonement isn't finished. Seems like I've heard that from some of those teachers about faith out west. So the Adventists have superimposed their philosophy on the Christian faith, and this is what man insists on doing. He won't start his own religion. Oh, I know the cults, the Buddhist and theosophy, but look at Christian science. It's not Mary, Baker, Eddie science, and the Church of the Latter-day Saints. Why don't they call themselves Joseph Smithites or something? Amen. And this is what Paul is warning us against. These who, in some form or another, are trying to superimpose their philosophies, the traditions of men, and whatever you invent is your tradition or philosophy, the creeds of men, to superimpose that upon the Word of God or the Christian faith. The Roman Catholic Church with its ritualism, ceremonialism, the prayers to the saints, their legalistic works teaching that you must earn your salvation as well as have faith in Christ. So they teach again after the tradition of men, the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. Paul is not only speaking out here against Things like Gnosticism, as we'll mention a little later, because form of asceticism and mysticism and so forth was early Gnosticism. But he's addressing himself here to those that he did like in Galatians, Galatians chapter 1, where they were trying to add works to salvation. 
And Paul addresses himself here to the Judaizers who obviously are working in Colossae just like they worked in Galatia. I guess you know they're both in Asia Minor. And they'd gotten up there and were teaching the people the same things. As we see here in chapter 2, all of these things about holy days, not eating meat, you must be circumcised, keep the law. That's why he's dealing with these things. These are legalistic things, you see. Circumcision, dealing with the law, and so forth. Now his answer to the Adventists and Catholics and the legalists, as well as these here in chapter 2 that he's writing about, is verses 9 and 10 of chapter 2, where he says that Jesus Christ is everything, and we're everything in Him. For in Him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, in bodily form. All of God is in Jesus Christ, and He says, we are filled with Him. In other words, we are complete in Him. We don't need anything else if we have Him. We don't need man's doctrines and teachings and add circumcision or observe the Sabbath or believe this or don't do that, you see. For in Him dwells all the fullness of God in bodily form, and ye, we, are complete in Him. So take away all of your traditions and your dead works and your Sabbaths, as the Adventists say I must keep, and your so-called deeper revelations. I neither want them or need them because I'm complete in Him. Now, remember all the stress that we have given you here, or he gives us, and I've brought forth in the teachings, of how Jesus Christ is everything, and he's answering people who think that you need to add something else to the revelation, as we said last week, as you received it in Christ when you were saved. Don't add anything to that. Stay with that simplicity. Quit trying to go deeper in the sense that you're following men to go deeper. Then you end up in shepherdship, neo-discipleship. Jesus' atonement is no longer effective the way they're teaching it now. Manifested sons and Jesus not being the eternal son. And Well, I just got a whole stack of things here that people get off in. Listening to angels. He mentions that a little later, the worshiping of angels. Stay with the truth the revelation as you received it in Jesus Christ. Because in Him dwells all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. In Him, not in some religious school, or some book, or somebody's tape, or some ministry. In Him is all of your wisdom and knowledge. That doesn't satisfy some people. They want, you know, to have something special. Always looking for some special idea, or some new doctrine to follow. So I don't need anything else. Verse 11 says I don't need circumcision in the flesh because I've been circumcised in the heart. Circumcision made without hands. Verses 12, 17 says I don't need to do anything because he says the law was blotted out for me having been nailed to the cross when they nailed his hands and feet to the cross that was nailing the old dispensation to the cross. Blotting out the law which was against us and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. Therefore, verse 16, let no man, prophet, apostle, whoever, pope, let no man judge you in meat or drink or a holy day or a new moon or a Sabbath, which are but a shadow of things to come. What do I need with the shadow when I've got the substance? You see, the legalists have their hope in a shadow, and I have El Shaddai, the real thing. Praise the Lord. His name is Jesus. Now, since the Adventists and Worldwide Church of God, Catholics and other legalists insist that we've got to do this or not do that or keep the law or keep the Sabbath, and since most Christians do not realize the seriousness of adding one jot or tittle to this revelation, then we need to remind you again what we taught you in the Galatian series, chapter 3 and verse 10. If you are under the law in any sense, he said, you're under its curse. And even more strongly, we need to admonish professing Christians what he said in chapter 1 of Galatians 
that if anybody, he says, even an angel from heaven comes and says that salvation's not by faith alone and adds anything to the faith message that you've got to do to be saved. He said, let him be accursed. He is accursed. And therefore, it ought to concern you when I stand up here and say Roman Catholics are under the curse. Because they turn that right around. Paul said, let any man, even an angel, be accursed if he says salvation is by faith and works. They turn that right around in their doctrine. And say, let him be accursed who says that salvation is by faith alone without works. For a man is saved by faith and works. Now anyone who doesn't know that knows nothing about Catholics. It ought to concern you. In a positive way and not in a critical way. Some people don't like you ever to mention anybody. Well, don't come to faith assembly. Because God is delivering a people out of that dead institutional system. Whether it's Catholicism or Methodism, Presbyterianism, Lutheranism, Baptistism. Because they're all isms. And not after Christ, but after the tradition of men and the rudiments of this world. You don't believe it, you take that plain word, I don't care whether it's healing or whatever, to them and you'll find they've made a God out of their creed and they won't receive the word. So it ought to concern you that Adventists have superimposed their philosophy on the Christian faith. And you get mail sometimes, what's wrong with the Seventh-day Adventists? You saying they're not saved? They're saying they're not saved. I don't have to say it. I don't care if charismatics do have Adventists and unity ministers at their full gospel meetings. They are wrong and it will be proven they're wrong in the end. That they're not more discerning. So it should concern you that the scriptures contradict what these legalists say. And people will just accept an Adventist like, well, he's already right. just a little mixed up on the Sabbath. He's a whole lot mixed up on the Sabbath. Read Galatians before you read Colossians 2, and then you'll get unmixed up yourself if you are mixed up. You see, Seventh-day Adventists must keep their people under the law in order to support their Sabbath doctrine because they know if they will admit to themselves what the New Testament clearly teaches, we're not under law as Christians in any sense, their Sabbath doctrine's dead. Because the Sabbath doctrine is right in the heart of the law, the fourth commandment. So they've got to tell you you must keep the commandments to be saved. Why, you can hear it every time you turn on an Adventist program. Like Worldwide Church of God. He denies Adventist connections, but he came out of Adventism. I'd like for you to turn to a passage while we're on legalism as the Adventists teach it. Exodus 31. And while you're turning there, do you realize there are people in charismatic circles who are now listening to a deceiving spirit? That spirit of deception and writing and saying we ought to keep the Sabbath, which is Saturday? Proves they know nothing of the Word of God. But that deceiving spirit is moving now in charismatic circles and ensnaring some. Look at Exodus 31, verses 16 and 17, and see to whom the Sabbath was given. Wherefore the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath. Who? The church? The world? The Adventists? He says the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations for a perpetual covenant. Now look at this. For it is a sign between me, God says, and the children of Israel forever. It's a sign between God and Israel never given to the church. It's a special sign, just like the first day of the week has a special meaning to the church, so the Sabbath had a special meaning to Israel. And he says right here in Colossians 2, the Sabbaths, that includes all of them, because as you've been taught on Wednesday, there's more than one Sabbath. At the beginning of the seven-day feast, the beginning and end, the first and last day was a Sabbath. But there's a high and holy Sabbath, which was the seventh day. And Paul says that was nailed to the cross. There it is. He says the same thing in Ezekiel 20, verses 12 and 20. That the Sabbath is a sign between me and Israel. You've got it in the Law and Prophets that it was a sign to Israel, not to the church to whom the first day has significance. Not to the world, 
nor those overzealous Christians in churches who are trying to superimpose a so-called Sabbath blue law on the secular community at large that is trying to get the businesses to close on Sunday. You can't legislate morality as the church to the secular community out there. And they talk about Sabbath observance and they don't bother to tell them that they're not telling them to close on Saturday but Sunday. They call it a Christian Sabbath, which is a misnomer. Two different dispensations. You can't even use those two words together. There's no such thing as a Christian Sabbath. Well, I've got an article here I wrote in a religious magazine. I didn't know whether I was going to take the time to read it or not. It would take about five minutes, but I can sum it up and say the title of it, A Christian Sabbath, question mark. The first paragraph says there isn't any such animal. Well, I didn't say it that way, but that's what I meant. The term is a misnomer. The term is a contradiction. There's no such thing as a Christian Sabbath. Sabbath means something to Israel. God said it's a sign to Israel. First day of the week means something to the church. And you can't commingle works and grace. And you cannot impose an Old Testament law upon a secular community when you're not under it yourself. Amen. How far away from truth and grace can they get when they say, oh, we're not under law, and then they turn right around and try to impose the law on the community out there and get them to close on a Christian Sabbath, Sunday. Do you see why the church is not involved and can't get involved in social and humanitarian, Amen. secular protests, movements. It's not her calling. Never was her calling. Some people have difficulty putting it all together and say, well, the prophets, you know, they preach to the secular community that is in Israel and said, have just weights and measurements and don't work on the Sabbath. And that was the whole nation. Well, of course, but that was a theocracy. And that world out there is not the nation of Israel, a theocracy. One day when the king comes and he'll be king over all the earth, we'll have a theocracy again. But only Israel was a theocracy. And of course we don't even try to call ourselves a theocracy, but a democracy. Others call themselves monarchies. There's no such thing as a theocracy without Jesus Christ reigning and ruling. And remember, God reigned and ruled literally on his throne in Israel. Because he says he does in more than one place. He said, I'll speak to you from between the cherubim on the kaporet. Translated mercy seat, whatever that means. But in Hebrew, it's the covering. So the church is not under law. How can the church turn around and legislate to the schools? You've got to get Bible reading back in it. Well, what are they going to read? What are they going to teach your children? To celebrate Christmas and Easter and not to believe that nonsense over there in faith assembly by divine healing? Amen. We have people knocking on the door. We sign this petition to get Bible reading back in the schools. We say, no, it's not the Christians calling to get into this agitation. They'll just work their heads off and run their legs off for some petition and wouldn't be caught dead in faith assembly if it was across the street or doing anything you know that God said to do learn his will and do it you've got to think these things through for yourself dear friends prayer in public schools if they don't pray in Jesus name most of the prayers you'll hear in public schools you know are not going higher than the ceiling you don't have to learn much about the word to know they're not going anywhere they're praying to an almighty, universal, absolute. And don't want to get Jesus in it because you might have a Jew as a student and you might have a Hindu as a student and so forth. So we'll just pray to Father. Everybody can pray to Father. Oh, I know there are exceptions to anything you say, but the church and the state are eternally separated and always will be. Jesus didn't try to agitate for political reforms and freeing the slaves and what have you. And praise God for clean politics and freeing the slaves. But the Bible message again and again to slaves is, think nothing of it. Serve your master well, not with eye-pleasing service, but do it humbly. Do what he says because you're actually serving your true master, Jesus Christ. He didn't say try to get free. He just said, 
Serve God wherever you are. Oh, a message the church hasn't heard in our day, and the church, for the most part, doesn't want to hear today. So what I'm saying is, dear friends, you can't impose the ethics of the Sermon on the Mount on the world out there. The social gospel preachers tried that after World War I. We're going to make the world a better place to live, and we'll educate them. I mean literal, secular education, and then we'll teach them the ethics of the Sermon on the Mount, and the kingdom of God will be ushered in on earth. After World War II, they were quite disillusioned. It was worse than the first one. Man wasn't getting better, he was getting worse. And after World War III, IV, V, VI, VII, VIII, IX, X, how many has it been? The world's been at war since World War II. So the Sabbath is not given to us. Don't bind me with a Sabbath commandment. I'm free. I'm not free to do as I please, or I wouldn't know Christ. But I'm free. I don't use my liberty as an occasion to the flesh. I don't cause my weak brother, who has to sit and listen to dead doctrine, and doesn't know some of the things Paul says, he doesn't have the light always I've got, so I won't offend my weak brother by eating meat sacrificed to idols or whatever. If he questions it, I'll put it aside till he learns that he can eat what he wants. That is, I'm not going to flaunt my freedom in Christ Jesus. But I'm not under the law. I'm not under the curse. For Jesus has set me free. For sickness I have health. For poverty wealth. Since Jesus ransomed me. Well, let's move on to mysticism. I'll tell you, we've got to get off of legalism or we just stay there all night. I really plan to cover all three errors tonight. Mysticism, verses 18 and 19. You know what mysticism is? It's what its name implies. Mystery. Let no man beguile you. See, men are so beguiling. Over in verse 8 he said, Don't let them spoil you, deceive you. So here, let no man beguile you of your reward in a voluntary humility and worshiping of angels, intruding into those things which he's not seen, but vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind. Now that's easy to understand. The next verse is a little harder. And not holding the head from which all the body but joints and bands having nourishment ministered and knit together increaseth with the increase of God. You understood that? Well, yes. He said, what he's been saying, Christ is everything. He's the head. We're the body. Stay with him. Stay in the body as you should be. Don't be running off following strange doctrines, worshiping of angels and so forth. Mysticism is the third religious error has always found its adherence in the church. People just seem to love the mysterious, the so-called deeper revelation. Somebody that had a vision, they'll follow him over a cliff. He said he had a vision. I mean it with all my heart. You could get into any group and claim a revelation that you never had, and there'll be people who will follow you. It's just the nature of things. It's always been that way. Now, mysticism, as its name implies, deals with that which is mysterious, hidden, that which is not unveiled or revealed, things beyond one's reason and intellect. Mysticism, the mysterious. Now, in Christianity, it's applied, first of all, to those people, and you'll find them today, as Paul did, who stress communion with God is to be through contemplation and meditation. Not so much the outward forms like gathering here, worshiping God in public, study of the word, teaching the word, but through meditation upon God and contemplation, you'll come to know God. Or at least you'll come into a deeper experience with God. Because truth is revealed to you intuitively. It's not something you search for in the word or through teaching, but you come to know truth by knowing God. See, it sounds very 
mysterious, spiritual. There are always those who are looking for the allegory or the spiritual meaning of something that doesn't need to be spiritualized. The mysterious. Mysticism speaks of those groups that stress the so-called deeper revelation, deeper insights. Our males just filled and cluttered with that kind of revelation. Like the Branhamites that make a god out of William Branham. Now I'm talking about the Branhamites. No reflection at all upon the man. I was dealing with a Branhamite over in the tent. He was passing out the literature and he doesn't think we have quite all the light we need that William Branham had it all and so forth. That's the usual way that they approach you or look upon you. They have the deeper revelation. Would you believe I taught here two or three studies ago from chapter 1, verse 20, how that there are those in charismatic circles who believe in ultimate reconciliation of everything, the wicked and the devil and the demons, and we gave the scriptures that showed and taught eternal punishment and would you believe a man came after that service and started challenging that? I mean, out of this body. When a person's in error, it's hard to pin them down, but I just stay with it. And I had to ask him five times, and the brother who brought him up here because he was mixed up, I turned to him before I asked him the fifth time. I said, you know, I've asked him four times if he agrees with the ministry here, if he believes the faith message, if he believes he's a part of it, all that requires is a yes or no. You either do or you don't. I said, now watch. I'm going to ask him the fifth time. <laughs> Are you with faith assembly or not? Part of it or not? Well, not sure. Well, I said, why don't you invite yourself out of faith assembly till you get sure. Then before you come back, come and see me and we'll see if you're sure. And that's about the way I talked. I wasn't upset. But here he comes up here, the same thing. Took me about three times. I said, it's a simple question I'm asking you. Do you believe in eternal punishment? Because I could tell he didn't. Because he started out with Branhamitism. And that was one of the errors of William Branham. That may be what cost him his life. He taught annihilation. And I'll tell you where he got it. He got it from the oneness people who teach it. But that's another story. I said, do you believe in eternal punishment? Couldn't get an answer. After about third or fourth time, I said, it's a simple question. Just a yes or no. No, I don't. I just believe in eternal separation. Now, see how subtle that is? You know, you don't deny eternal punishment. Get up and preach a sermon against eternal punishment or the reality of hell. But see, very subtly in your teachings, your mystical interpretation of the Word of God, you find passages that seem to say what you want them to say. But you know, I tell people you'll never get away from the passage in Revelation 14 where we're told the smoke of their fire and torment arises forever and ever. That's not annihilationism. That's not eternal separation. That's eternal punishment. Well, of course, we gave all the scriptures, but my question is, would you believe they still get in here? I don't know what to do except put a, not a padlock, but a combination lock on the door, give the true saints the combination. But how do I know who the true saints are? I'm not God, so I don't know. And we just have to wait until those who are not his sheep reveal themselves. If you can't line up with the Word of God and what we believe is the Word of God and the basic requirements to be a member of Faith Assembly, you're not a member. Amen. Now, we're not talking to those that know how to say amen to what I just said. We're talking to those that can't say amen, those who might get offended, those who've got some little area in their life they've not dealt with yet. Now that piece of paper says what the Word of God says in 1 Corinthians 1.10 that we are to be in absolute agreement on everything. Amen. He says it four times. One mind, one judgment. Amen. Well, you're not a church if you're not that. And I've been through that denominational system and it's not a church. Because you couldn't get two people to agree. The man who agreed with me 
My best friend betrayed me. In that kind of system, well, mysticism, Branhamites, little group in Ohio that think we don't have the deeper revelation because we practice apostolic baptism. They baptize three times. Once isn't enough. Try an immersion. Though you can't find it in the Word. They say they are the virgins of Revelation 14. Well, now they're not anywhere near 144,000, so I don't know where the rest are going to come from. I thought some would come from this body. But they take it literally, literally virgins. Unmarried males, if you please. Deeper revelation. They won't fellowship with us. And most of them, that is the nucleus of that group, got the baptism of the Holy Ghost right here. Then all of a sudden got deeper revelation, disappeared. Well, I leave them to the Lord. I'm not standing here in judgment on them, but I'm saying, as I said to them, you are the virgins. I'm married. You mean I can't be an overcomer? They mean overcomers. The virgins are the overcomers. That's select first fruits group. I said, poor old Peter won't make it either. <laughs> Paul might make it, but Peter won't. Nor any of the other apostles. I tried to show them how ridiculous that is. Spiritual virgins, not literal virgins. Because one thought in the mind. And I delivered one of them from a spirit of lust. I told him by word of knowledge what he had wrong with him. And he nearly fell off the chair. Well, he isn't married yet, but how's he going to make it in? He's been an adulterer in his heart. And Jesus said, that's adultery in Matthew 5, in case you haven't read the Sermon on the Mount. You see where spiritualizing and mysticism and allegorizing so-called deeper revelations get you into corners you can't get out of spiritually. Stay with the Word, the message last week. Listen to that message over and over. We'll lend you a tape or give you a tape. You need to hear that to understand what we're saying tonight. Stay with the revelation as it's in Christ. All the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are in Him, not prophet so-and-so, teacher so-and-so, apostle so-and-so. And I have no, of course, objection to those offices because I believe in them. And then the Florida Four prophets have come up with a new one. Mystical teaching of that group. Derek Prince, Charles Simpson, Don Basham, and Bob Mumford. You know what they're teaching now? 1 Corinthians 10 means this is a deeper revelation. You didn't know. You know about 1 Corinthians 10? said they were all who went through the Red Sea were under the cloud. They were baptized in the Red Sea. They were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud in the sea. You must be baptized into your Moses. Oh, that was rich. That was just waiting for somebody to mine and bring up those deeper truths. And someone gave me a tape how I was to be baptized into my Moses. And when I listened to the tape, it didn't take long to get confirmation that the tape defends the Florida Four as prophets of truth. And it goes on to promote the key to discipleship. Here it is. Key to discipleship based upon 1 Corinthians 10. You must be immersed into your pastor. Be baptized into the spirit of your pastor. Just think of the people being baptized into their spirits. That spirit of deception that teaches neo-discipleship. Someone from Australia here a few weeks ago said, is that still active? Is that still going on? I said, it's just as strong as ever, but more so. It's just kind of beneath the surface, like I predicted it would be. After the initial thrusts against it, and we led in that opposition, and many got their eyes open, I said, it'll go underground as it were. It'll just kind of bubble beneath the surface. And the first thing you know, that cancer will be spread all over the charismatic movement. You watch and see. Mysticism. 
Now the particular error Paul's talking about here in verses 18 and 19 is a type of piety, voluntary humility, and the worshiping of angels. You see, as we said at the outset of teaching this epistle, this is really the beginning of Gnosticism, which the word itself in Greek means to know. And these deeper revelation prophets were in the church from the beginning. You know, they crept in from the beginning. You see the beginning of Gnosticism here. As you read church history, you see actually what is involved here is the doctrine of emanations, which came out of Greek philosophy. And by his mention of the worship of angels here, we know he's talking about that which secular history records. It's out of Greek philosophy. The idea is this, that God is too other than, too holy, too righteous, too far above his created order that he can communicate directly with it. So he has created spirit beings and angels, emanations out from deity between God and man. And Jesus Christ is one of those emanations, the highest, but nevertheless one of them. So that's what he's striking out against here, but compare that, if you will, to the Roman Catholic doctrine of intermediaries. They're bowing down and praying to Mary and to angels and to the saints. They've got their own doctrine of intermediaries between God and man. Comes right out of pagan Greek philosophy. Someone else wrote me about a woman friend of hers that was anointed, she said, to speak in tongues and then began to interpret and said the first words out of her mouth were, Thus saith Gabriel. Gabriel? Why, she said, angels don't inspire you to prophesy. The Holy Spirit does. What did Gabriel say through you? Well, she said, that's the bad part. It didn't edify. But you know, I accepted it. Hook, line, and sinker. See, involved in the idea of bowing down to, worshiping, or listening to angels. And I could tell you other accounts of people that have their intermediaries. Like one woman told me, for example, that she listened to the Apostle Paul. He would appear to her literally like I'm here, or you're here, and teach her the deeper things. Until one day, I read about another group in Florida that this angel has appeared to this church, this charismatic group, and now he speaks through the pastor's daughter. He doesn't realize that's mediumship, like a seance. And she was reading this account, how that when the angel leaves, sounds like a jet taking off. And she got to thinking about that. She said, the next time Paul appeared where she had been taking notes and all that. Next time he appeared, she said, I challenge that. I said, in the name of Jesus. I plead the blood of Jesus against that and said, he disappeared in a flash and that same sound, shh, taken off. Another woman insists that Peter is writing to her. In a meeting where I taught for about three years, she said, when I read Peter, she says, the type fades out on the page the scriptures what Peter wrote to the church and Peter begins to write directly to me and give me this deeper revelation now there are people who would stand in line to get that kind of revelation and insist that oh you're just not with it you're afraid the idea of the allegorizing spiritualizing mysticizing just seems to intrigue people. And it leads people off especially into error concerning the doctrine of Christ. You end up with all sorts of errors and deception concerning the Godhead. Like the Way group out in Ohio that deny the eternal sonship of Jesus Christ. And that opens doors to other spirits that you let in. They say, well, Jesus Christ is the Son of God, but he's not the eternal Son of God. I had a man who sat under my ministry for three years and went out there to one meeting and came back said, I got new revelation, deeper revelation. Jesus Christ is not the eternal Son of God. And they teach that nowhere in the Old Testament is he called the Son of God, that he's not called the Son before his incarnation. Prior to that, he was the Logos, but not a son. God had no son until 
that baby born in Bethlehem. John 3.16, they tell us. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And we're told he is begotten, you see, begotten by God. There's his beginning. He was begotten. But monogamous, as we've taught you in our theology classes, does not mean what King James says. It doesn't remotely mean what the King James translation says. Monogamous means unique, or the only one of his kind, or its kind, whatever you're talking about. Should have been translated as the French translation does. For God so loved the world that he gave his unique son, the only one like him. He was not begotten or made or created. Colossians 1, John 1, and Ephesians says he created all things. How are you going to get him creating himself if he had a beginning? And so monogamous means unique. Remember in Hebrews 11:17, it is said that Abraham sacrificed Isaac, his only begotten son. The same word used again in King James. Well, certainly Isaac was not Abraham's only begotten son. He had other sons. In fact, he had a son before he had Isaac, and that was Ishmael. So how could Isaac be the only begotten? It should be translated there just as it should be translated in John 3.16. That Isaac was his unique son. He's the son of the promise. He's the miracle son. Abraham's 100, Sarah's 90. You could go around the world and back and never get the translation only begotten. It has nothing to do with begetting, but with kind. This mystical idea, and they present it so subtly. Because you don't know the word, oftentimes people will rack their brain. Well, yes, that's true. He wasn't the son before he became the babe Jesus. He was the logos, John says in John 1.1. 1, 1. And where is he called the son in the Old Testament? Well, where is he called the son in the Old Testament? Psalm 2, Daniel 3, Daniel 7. And they tell you son doesn't occur in the Old Testament. Thou art my son, Psalm 2. This day have I begotten thee. Now there, begotten's all right, but he's talking about begetting from the dead. Read Acts 13. Paul cites Psalm 2. He says, I'm quoting from Psalm 2, and David spake of his resurrection when he said, Thou art my son, this day I've begotten thee. So it doesn't speak of his birth, and he's called son in the Old Testament. Daniel, I saw coming in the clouds one like unto the Son of Man. When old Nebuchadnezzar looked in the fiery furnace, Daniel's three friends, he said, I see one in there like the Son of God. Amen. Even the heathen make a better confession Amen. than these way teachers. And of course it's dangerous. I just picked up a letter today I was reading. He said, I was listening to your tape on the Godhead and thanking God he had set him free with the teaching. He said, I allowed a man two years ago to lay hands on me who did not believe in the eternal sonship of Jesus Christ. He said, from that time I had trouble believing in his deity. You see, denial of his eternal sonship is one step removed from the denial of his eternal deity. It's the same spirit that will rob you of that, then you've got nothing. You know why I believe in the eternal sonship? Because the Bible teaches it. And if you don't know the Word of God enough to know that, you're just pray, P-R-E-Y, to these deceivers, mystical teachers, those who would beguile and deceive and rob you of the simplicity that's in Jesus Christ. I believe in the eternal sonship just from logic besides scriptures because if... The Son is not the eternal Son, then who's the Father the Father of? Before there was a Son. If the Father's not the eternal Father and the Son's not the eternal Son, and since the Father's called the Father in the Old Testament before He had a Son in Bethlehem, as well as the New, then who was He the Father of before He had a Son, unless He already had a Son? You can't get around that. He is the Father and called the Father in the Old Testament. Who's He the Father of? You know, before I had a child, I was married. People could call me a husband, but it would be a little ridiculous to say, he's a father. A father of what? I don't have a child. But God is called the father. He's called the father in the Old Testament before he had a physical son on this earth. And who's he the father of if he has no child? 
to be the father of. He's always the father. He's always been the father. The son's always been the son. And I'd just like to turn you to a familiar passage to prove to you that he's always been the son. From God's own word, John chapter 3. Everybody knows John 3.16. Well, I want to show you John 3.16 with John 3.17. For God so loved the world that he gave his unique Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Who did he give? The Logos? The Son. And then verse 17. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world. He didn't send the Logos. He was the Logos to be sure. But that is what the Bible says. It says he sent his Son into the world that the world might be saved. And you get the same teaching in 1 John 4, 9. It says the same thing. God sent his Son into the world. That ought to settle it for a Christian. The Bible doesn't say he sent the Logos into the world who became his Son. He sent his Son, asked the Son into the world. He was always his son. It's very important for you to believe in the eternal sonship of Christ because, like I said, the next step is to deny his eternal deity. You know, if God had wanted to tell us that he was not the eternal father, that he had no eternal son, he had 66 books to make it plain in. Why didn't he just say it once? I'm going to send the Logos and he'll become a son. He didn't become anything. That's God-man. He was always the son. You see, you don't find in the Bible ever the expression Father, Logos, and Holy Spirit. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is always equated with the eternal Godhead, deity. you got problems, dear friends, when you get away from the simplicity that's in Jesus Christ. All the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are hidden in Him. You see, this deception about His eternal Sonship is a form of mysticism that's getting more popular in the church today among professing charismatics. It confuses his relationship with the world to his relationship with the Father. He's son of man in relationship to the world, but he's son of God in relationship to God. And at the incarnation, we don't read that the son of God took upon the form of a son, but that he took upon himself the form of a man, not the form of a son. He was already that. And by the way, the oneness group denies the eternal sonship of Christ. Well, there's so much to say about that form of mysticism that tried to arise in this body, the seven spirits of God error by the group that we had to dismiss. That was just one of the reasons. I listened to the tapes until it just sickeningly ran out my ears. Here's some of the things I jotted down. He's got the seven spirits doctrine whereby he divides up the Holy Spirit into seven spirits. Quotations from Isaiah 11. These are seven spirits of God. Speaks of wisdom, knowledge. He says all of these are spirits. In fact, I never have found the seventh one in that group. I can only find six. He says these are seven living spirits. These are seven spirits sent from God to us. Literal spirits. Each of these spirits was in the presence and possession of God from all eternity. That makes ten. Because he divides them up into confusion of ideas. He's got spirit of God, spirit of Christ, Holy Spirit, and seven spirits. That makes ten. Isaiah 11 isn't speaking of seven spirits. If you can find seven attributes there. There are only six mentioned. Isaiah 11 is speaking of Messiah's perfections, his attributes. Speaks of the operation of the Spirit of God, the one Spirit. Read 1 Corinthians 12. One Spirit, many operations. Why don't they bother to get that into their new doctrine? Ephesians 4. There are seven spirits, one Spirit. Now, people who do not know the Word of God, you see, they just get swept off their feet because you can find a passage in Revelation that speak of the seven eyes of God and the seven spirits of God, and they don't take that with the whole Revelation, and they end up fragmenting the Godhead. 
You've got ten spirits going there. I named them all. I'll tell you, I never heard such a confused individual in my life. He speaks of the Spirit of God and distinguishes that from the Spirit of Christ and distinguishes both of those from the Holy Spirit. You've got God divided up into three already. He's not three. He's one. Eternal Spirit manifested as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Always has been Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. One Spirit. Well, let's get on to asceticism or we'll not make it through tonight. Verses 22 through 23, asceticism. Wherefore, if you be dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world, the ways of the world, then why, as though living in the world, are you still subject to ordinances? Touch not, taste not, handle not, which will all perish with the using. Then he takes up the thought after the commandments and doctrines of men. In other words, such teaching is from man. Which things have indeed a show of wisdom in will worship and humility and the neglecting of the body, not in any honor to the satisfying of the flesh. Well, that didn't help much. So let me give you a literal translation of that verse. He says, asceticism, these things have an appearance of wisdom in voluntary worship on your part and in humility on your part, but they're not of any value against the indulgence of the flesh. That's what Paul said. Ascetic practices. Don't do this. Don't eat meat. Deny certain normal functions of the body to make yourself more holy is what he's talking about. Religious asceticism, ascetic practices, means punishing the flesh to make it better or to make yourself more holy. Like these people are always fasting, 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 trying to get more holy or more righteous. They don't realize that fasting is a dead work just like going to the temple and offering a sacrifice unless it's something done from the heart. You don't get holy by fasting. You may need to fast in your quest for righteousness and holiness in order to draw closer to God, but it's not the fasting that does it. Fasting has no merit in itself. People try to make a good work out of fasting. And so he says, these things have an appearance of using wisdom in your voluntary going beyond what most do in this sort of worship and in what appears to be genuine humility. You're a pious, holy person. But he says, these things are no value against the temptations or indulgences of the flesh. I'm glad Paul said it. I don't think everybody that would hear me say it would agree with that. I'm glad he said it. Because some people really have hang-ups on asceticism. And some of you may be practicing forms of asceticism and not know it. That's why God has set ministry in the church. I am repeatedly dealing with people in and out of this body who can't seem to put one foot in front of the other for a solid week without getting off into something or thinking they've got more light than you have. Now that is, thus saith the Lord. There's a ministry set in this church for you to give heed to, to obey. If you can't obey it, goodbye. Amen. Hebrews 13, Titus 2, speak and rebuke with all authority. I ought to be able to sit in my study and get in the Word. And prepare messages and teachings that will help you mature. I should not have to be dealing with problems in the body. Not this body. Not this long. I still deal with it. Everything from natural childbirth where they think they got more light to secular education. Why people just can't take the simplicity of the word. Stay with it. Not always trying to get something going. If they think they've got light on or whatever. Oh, my friends, you don't know where some of you are missing it. That's not in the Old Testament. God gave them an abundant life. That says nothing of their fastings on the Day of Atonement. They were not ascetics, monks, nuns, hermits. They didn't have some charismatic communal community like we see raising up all over now where you're going to live together, eat together 
Those things are self-defeating. Don't you know that it didn't work in Switzerland under Calvin? It didn't work in the New England states when the church tried to control morality. It didn't work among the brethren or the Amish or any of the other groups who try to isolate themselves. They finally just die off. They've got an old order German Baptist community out in Pennsylvania. I visited it. It couldn't perpetuate itself because the men and women, even wives and husbands, no longer slept together. It died off of natural causes. <laughs> the Essene community, just before Christ, nothing but men in the community. It died off. It had to. They would adopt boys to teach them the law just before Christ came. Asceticism has nothing to do with Old Testament religion. It's certainly not in the New Testament because those promises are carried right over and given to us. Prosperity, healing, blessing. In fact, many more than Israel had because they had but the shadow. Asceticism is not living the crucified life. Living the crucified life we teach. We've got a whole book on it entitled Deeper Life in the Spirit. We believe in it. But living the crucified life does not imply fleeing the world to a convent or nunnery or to a charismatic communal community where you're going to share everything in common. That's not New Testament. Jesus said, hear it, John 17, Father, I pray for my sheep that you don't take them out of the world. Some of you are still trying to flee the world or get your children out of the world. You can't do it. Teach them what's right, like he did. I pray not you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from evil in the world. Paul said, don't company with fornicators. But he says, I don't mean it absolutely because you'd have to go out of the world. You've got to work with them, sell to them. Sit by them sometimes in the church. Oh, friends, there are no shortcuts to make it up there. You've got to go through it the hard way like the rest of us. Religious asceticism is foreign to the Bible. Paul says here, in effect, it's inspired by a religious spirit of false humility, which things have an appearance of wisdom in voluntary worship and humility, but he says they're of no value against the indulgence of the flesh. Asceticism, whatever form it takes, vegetarianism, where you... Don't eat pork. You know we got charismatics teaching we shouldn't eat pork. Asceticism, whether it's forbidding of meats, not eating pork, constant fastings to make you more holy or more righteous, and we approve of fasting because it's taught in the New Testament when the motive's right, so don't misquote us. But some people are always on a 40-day, 30-day, 10-day, 20-day journey of not eating. Sometimes in the body, we've had to tell people, get off that and start eating. We don't want you dying here. We've got enough criticism from the media and the authorities. <laughs> don't drop dead even at home, especially in church. <laughs> Our people who can't rest, they're so busy and quote the Lord's work, unquote. And he himself said rest. I told a dear Christian just recently, you've got to rest. You can't minister to all those people to come to your home like you're doing. You can't do it. It's wearing you out by your own confession. Bad fast, but trying to do too much. Now, God knows what he wants you to do. And he made the body that he wants you to do it with and through. And he expects you to take care of it and rest as a part of it. It just makes them feel pious and holy and righteous. Some people just to go till they drop. I learned long ago to use some methods in my ministry because I can foresee not a thousand here, but tens of thousands who are writing letters. I can't handle all that. I can't tell you in a paragraph or a sentence why Jesus prayed twice for that blind man. It would take a course in theology. You ought to already know yourself. A pastor says, why? Just one question. I can't answer all that mail. It just piles up. We've got a form letter now. You ought to read it. 
we're encouraging Christians to believe the Lord, get into His Word, get the books, get the tapes. And of course, we give them to people that seem to need them. But denial of marriage. All of these things, you see, is a useless sort of diversion or work or discipline that will not help you at all in your spiritual growth. Now certainly there are places in the Word of God where we are encouraged to fast and to pray. We're encouraged to walk the crucified walk, live the cross life. And if you have the gift, it's okay not to marry. But you're not to get married and decide you've got the gift. That is going to make you more holy to abstain <laughs> after marriage as... All, all too often that's happened and ruined a marriage. That is going to make you more spiritual. You see, asceticism is just a form of that old Greek philosophy, that doctrine that matter is evil. Whatever's created is evil. And that God will have nothing to do with it. The soul is imprisoned in the body. And so salvation is somehow getting freed, though you stay in the body, freed from the body itself, even though you're still in it. You do that by punishing the body, hating the flesh, denying everything, even good things, normal things. Luther found that whipping his body didn't make him more spiritual or bring in a feeling or contentment of righteousness. That's how he discovered justification by faith. He tried the other way, sleeping all night in zero weather in a monastery with the window open, the snow blowing in on his naked body. He didn't get more spiritual, just got more coals. <laughs> Romans 12, 1. Present your bodies a living sacrifice? Yes. But that doesn't mean to forbid the eating of pork. That doesn't mean to go on a 40-day fast to try to become more spiritual. That doesn't mean forsaking marriage. Unless, as we say, God is giving you the gift. And I guarantee you one hundredth of one percent at the most have that gift. Because God didn't make you that way. That's to degrade the family structure as God ordained it. But there are those exceptions, and praise God, they're no more righteous or holy, but they're better servants for the most part. Paul says that. Do I need to explain it? He said it. It's in 1 Corinthians. The person who marries seeks to please wife or husband. The person who just marries Christ seeks to please him. Obviously, you have a little more time to serve the Lord. And you can give your full attention to it. If you have the gift, if you don't have the gift, you're not going to give your full attention to it. You're going to be trying to fast or beat your body into subjection so you won't lust. He says it's better to marry than to burn. So Romans 12 means what it says. Present your bodies and your minds living sacrifices. But that isn't asceticism. Because Paul himself said in Ephesians 5.29, contrary to the ascetics, he said no man hates his flesh. But he nourishes it. And he cherishes it. As Christ does the church. Look what he compared. Christ's relationship to his body to our feeling toward our own body. No, you don't hate your flesh. If you do, you need deliverance. You should hate what the flesh could do if you allow it. That's another subject. The Bible teaches we are to crucify the flesh, not to hate it. Crucify the flesh, not despise it. Crucify the flesh, not to mutilate it, to harm it or to hurt it. No, your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, 1 Corinthians 3 and 6. Take care of that body. We are to crucify it with respect to its appetites and lusts. You should take Romans 6 with Romans 12. Romans 6 says to crucify the flesh in its appetites and lusts. Not to treat matter as something evil in itself. It's the use it's put to. The flesh is not the source or seat of sin, but the heart, the mind, the will. Read the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus makes it plain that you... Sin with the heart. You're angry with your brother. You've violated the commandment against killing him. 
You lust in your heart against a man or a woman, you violated the commandment against adultery. It's in the heart, not the flesh. The flesh will do whatever you let it do. You are to control it. Let not sin reign in your mortal body, he said. You are to reign over it. Jesus said, in effect, you could pluck your eyes out. And the fleshly eyes are gone and still lust in your heart. And so you've committed the sin. You could cut your hands off so you couldn't steal and still covet my new car. Covet somebody's property. Sin isn't in the flesh. You're not to hate the flesh. You're to hate what it will do if you let it have its control. Mature Christians are not punishing their flesh to be more holy. But because they're holy, they control and regulate the flesh and its appetites. There's a big difference. I hope that came through. I didn't shout it, but that's where it's at. It's by your attitude. What's in your heart? You see, a 40-day fast to make you more holy or to bring your body into subjection, a 40-day fast would be a waste of time if you lusted with your eyes for 40 seconds. You just wasted 40 days. A 40-day fast to bring your life and body and flesh into subjection is a waste of time if for 40 seconds you resent me for what I just said. You got any bitterness over what I've said tonight? You wasted your fast. Because holiness and righteousness does not reside in the flesh, but in the heart. And the flesh is just an instrument for righteousness or unrighteousness. And so asceticism means nothing, profits nothing, Paul says, with respect to holiness or righteousness. It appears to, but he says that's just a waste of time. So avoid all of these religious errors, religious intellectualism, legalism, mysticism, and that covers the whole range of all of this deeper revelation we're getting today. So much of it, I should say. And lastly, a false humility expressed in not doing this, not doing that. You can't be too holy. You can't be too humble. You can't be too pure and righteous. But Paul says it doesn't come through these ascetic practices. That's a delusion. It's going to come through faith and obedience to the Word of God.